Hello, I'm Jennifer, and welcome to the Crew of Japan podcast, a weekly podcast where we take you on audio journeys through Japanese culture. Welcome back to our podcast. Today is going to be a special episode. The topic is on language quote unquote fluency and how this can be done through language immersion. We're going to dive deep into what that may actually mean. To help us understand this way of language learning, we invited Matt Verse Japan, a YouTuber who aims to help language learners to proficiency. But first, before that, we have the crew, and we're going to be talking about our language goals. All right, so I'm with the crew, and one of the things I want to start talking about is, you know,、um, what do we want to learn from the Japanese language? Like, why, why are we learning the language? Because that's a big thing on learning Japanese. You know, what's your motivation?、Uh, I kind of started、um, predictably to understand music a, a little better. Um, and create some of my own translations of songs. <laughs> and that was like one of the first things that really got me into like, you know, learning hiragana and, and really like delving for meaning.、Um, and actually,、uh, it really struck me recently, kind of like reassessing that and wondering, why am I still learning? <laughs> I, I think recently I've discovered that I no longer have that same motivation tied to music, but it's more of like a, a, a question mark now. Like maybe I want to retire there. I think that's a good, <laughs> that's a good goal. I want to know enough Japanese to retire on a small island somewhere. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it's really like learning is fluid. It changes, you know, your goals are going to be constantly changing and evolving as you age and grow in your true, life. True. You know, like where I was at, like, what was it, high school when I started to try to teach myself, you know, because again, it was when I was big into anime, right?、Um, so that was kind of my initial motivation、uh, to learn. Similar, similar to like you said.、Mm. Um, but all, it started kind of superficially almost. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then I thought about it and I kind of looked at colleges and see, saw where. Where they were teaching Japanese, so that way I could maybe pursue that alongside my degree instead of you know, studying Spanish or French, taking Japanese. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. Like, it was definitely like that in the beginning where it was just like, I want to watch anime. I think it'd be cool to just like learn Japanese so I could teach myself. And then I got to college and I was like, oh, maybe I could like take this up a notch and go a little bit more serious. But then my college specifically didn't give enough classes of the Japanese language. So I had to go back and study on my own again. And as much as I love、uh, trying to trust myself,、um, I can't trust myself. <laughs> I can't trust myself to study. Yeah, self study takes a lot of discipline.、It、I、does. mean, you have to really kind of set achievable, I don't want to say achievable, but something that's a challenge, but like also. Something that you can attain. You know, it, it, it's like, okay, this is a realistic goal, not just, I want to be fluent by tomorrow.、Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, impossible.、Um, yeah, definitely. If you're self studying, that's, that's, you're committing yourself to never learning the language、yeah. if you're going from like zero to 50. And I have a tendency to do that. So I have to be careful because I like, I'm like, oh, I'm smart. I'll figure it out. It's like, no, no. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, no. Well, you set yourself up for like, Burnout. Yeah. You know,、exactly. like you're like, oh, I want to do、yes. it so bad. I want to do it so bad. And then your your expectations kind of hit that wall of, you know, oh, I can't get past this one piece. And I thought I was going to be already five steps、yeah. ahead, you know? So it all comes back to those、uh, expectations. I mean, I can, you know, my, myself, like I, I, my goal in college was to study so that way I can apply language to, you know, my business degree、mm-hmm. that I ended up going in and graduating with. And,、uh, and, and I'm working in healthcare IT now. So I have been not even using my, I mean, using my business degree, but、um, you know, I'm not using Japanese at all in work. Yeah. So yeah. You know, that's, that's one of the things too. I mean, it's just, it's just evolution. And you want to make sure that you understand that 
your goals are going to change and you're you need to be able to adapt to that moving target yeah, as you that, go along that's true. definitely because like in college i i would have loved to major in japanese but just our college just didn't have the capacity to do it and then so i was like okay well self-study i want to know enough japanese to like get by in japan which i i achieved i i did that goal check mark for me um you know i went to japan after you know four years of not going there from study abroad and um, it was pretty good. Um, I was able to get around. I was able to communicate, um, you know, impress my husband with my skills. Um, and then, you know, I was like, I guess I don't really need to learn anymore uh, since, you know, I, I accomplished my goal. But now I have this job where, you know, I do work in a sense in Japan, sort of. And I do have to communicate with Japanese people. So I'm like, oh, man, now I have to raise the bar up higher. And I'm not I don't know how I'm going to get there. <laughs> well, I think one of the things, too, is, um, you know, the type of language that you're going to be using is to, to kind of prepare your studies centric around that language. Now, I know that's not always going to be what people recommend, but if you're going to be using certain types of verbs or certain types of adjectives all the time or like vocabulary, then, um, you know, that's something that at least if you can understand and learn those words, things that you're going to be using. For example, when I was on jet, you know, there was a lot of words in like lesson plans or in the classroom that I need to understand how to, you know, use or just educational, uh, educational Japanese terminology, things like that, that really, you know, understanding those words and being able to use them allowed me to sound much more fluent than I actually was. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. And I think another thing too that we kind of touched on is remembering to keep it fun. You know, like remembering to reward ourselves. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. And like uh not not both not push too far, but also like keep it engaging for ourselves, like not getting drawn too much into a textbook keeping it relevant so that we can get those little like moments of yes yes i kind of let i kind of let y'all know you know where i'm trying to get to in my you know japanese language journey where are y'all trying to get to like what's y'all's quote unquote type of fluency that you want in japanese because fluent is such a um such a general word it, it can mean so many things to so many different people so what's your definition of like your fluency in japanese i i guess where i would want to be um in terms of fluency is somewhere where i can at least effectively communicate without struggling um in in daily life i mean obviously there's going to be words i don't know or um ways of saying something that is more elegant than the way I would say it, you know, <laughs> of course, like there's going to be times when I sound like a Neanderthal, um, grunting and, and stumbling across words. Um, but you know, I, I would like to get past that barrier and I, I have to an extent, but, um, you know, I, I would like to be able to more, uh, more, uh, yeah. I like to be able to com communicate more effectively with some of my Japanese friends and, and, you know, my, my in-laws, uh, I mean, my sister-in-law speaks, pretty good English, like, you know, pretty fluent in my opinion, you know? Um, so we, I always, when I'm talking with her, most of the times it switched over to English than Japanese, but my mother-in-law doesn't speak, you know, any, any English whatsoever, really. So um, being able to communicate in, in Japanese better with her would be a fantastic, that's, that's, that's really my goal. Like for, for organic use, not really, I'm not trying to be like fluent so I can go work for a company or a business it's just more so of uh, trying to just be able to effectively communicate what I want to say. Yeah, you gotta gotta be able to communicate with those in-laws. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> what about you, Maddie? I guess like for me, it would be this level of like feeling like somebody doesn't have to put on an air to meet me where I'm at. <laughs> Um, if I could get to the point where I could speak to somebody so that they feel like they're speaking to a fellow Japanese person, <laughs> right? And like not changing their language to make themselves more comprehensible to me, that 
would be my ideal version of fluent. It's a little more conceptual than in-laws, but <laughs> no, I, I mean I get it. Like, okay, you cool. Want them yeah, to treat you as a language equivalent, right? Right. Yeah, that's exactly the what I'm trying to say. That would be ideal, you know. You know, and that's actually a really interesting point. Like I, I think it's almost I, you. That's something you want, but I feel like um, it's it's natural for you to adapt your language to the audience you're talking to for example like in a business setting you know I'll, I'll switch up my vocabulary and the way i talk to people and just in general you know i'm not like talking uh more politely than i would with my friends you know so um and i, I mean honestly if you think about it, japan too like they have the, the the levels and the degrees of honorifics that you use when speaking to people who are in a quote-unquote higher position than society than you are or maybe a senpai kohai like someone that may be a quote-unquote underling you know so um you know there's there's varying degrees and then i think there's always set that barrier too that foreigners have when speaking with japanese people is that they will kind of not give you the feedback or you know if you're using something or incorrectly they, they you may not find out what what you did wrong or right but flip that flip that to the other side i, I mean i know I unintentionally sometimes will slow down my speech when I know that someone I'm speaking with someone that's like maybe English is their second language or maybe not their second language as in they're not fluent. I will slow it down if I see that, if I sense that there is a struggle there to understand, or if I sense that maybe I've caught them off guard with a phrasing or a word. Yeah. yeah it's only natural. Yeah. And I think that like what I'm kind of trying to say is that like I, my goal is that sense of feeling like I want to convince you that you can talk to me like I am, yeah. you know, just some gal from down the street. And that's the kind of stuff that takes time. Yeah. So it's going to take some it's, time. Mm -hmm, absolutely. But it, it it is a strong feeling, you know? I think it's like a comfort level too with the people that, I mean, because I think in, I think in general, you know, there's a barrier of just speaking Japanese as a non-native Japanese speaker is always going to have that kind of barrier you have to overcome initially. There's always going to be that barrier, you, regardless of how fluent you are, even if it's just a short barrier for like a minute or two, then, then the person you're speaking with may realize, oh, they actually, this person really knows their Japanese. Okay. But it, there's always going to be a little barrier, I feel like. Yeah. And I figure we have the rest of our lives to kind of learn, which makes it seem a lot less daunting somehow. For real. So, yeah, we talked about all these like goals and language goals and fluency, but who can really help us navigate this topic perfectly is Matt Verse Japan. He is a YouTuber who, you know, is trying to help people with their Japanese language, um, giving them helpful tips on how to study. And I feel like with his um, language ability in Japanese, he is able to help us really navigate, you know, immersing ourselves in the language. So let's go on to that interview. I would like to give a warm welcome to our guest, uh, Matt from the channel Matt vs. Japan. Yeah, so yeah, I'm Matt. Thanks for having me on. So I understand you've been able to actually do what many people feel is impossible, and that is actually successfully teach yourself Japanese outside of Japan. Uh, yeah, I taught myself Japanese to a pretty high level in about five years. Six months of those I was living in Japan, but for the rest of the time I was inside of the United States. And now I have a YouTube channel called Matt Rich Japan, where I explain the kind of unorthodox methods that I use to reach a really high level of Japanese outside of Japan. And I recently started started a new website called refold.la, where I really take the method that I used and put it into a structured format that makes it a lot easier, hopefully, for other people to replicate. Yeah, and Matt, what made you interested in Japan in the first place? Like, why learn Japanese? Yeah, well, I think like a lot of people in the West who are interested in Japanese, uh, I watched anime as a child, and that had a really big, uh, left a really big impression on me. And when I was in high school, and I was watching anime uh, as a kind of teenager for the first time, it really clicked that these shows that I loved as a kid, like Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, Beyblade, Dragon Ball Z, 
those were from Japan. And something about that just made me really interested in the culture. Uh, also, when I kind of had this epiphany that I was really interested in Japanese culture, I was watching uh, an anime in Japanese with English subtitles for the first time. So it was my first time really hearing the Japanese language and something about it, about the, the visuals and uh, the, the sound of the language just made me feel like I really want to pursue this, learn more about this, learn this language. It's not a rational thing at all. It was just uh, something deep, deep within me just pushed me to do it. As, as soon as I had this epiphany, I just knew I, I was never more confident about anything else in my life uh, than I was that I wanted to learn Japanese. That's awesome. Do you remember what the anime was? Yeah, it was Yu-Gi-Oh! Season Zero. Hey. The story behind that was uh, when I was a kid, I loved Yu-Gi-Oh! The anime and the, the, the cards. And when I was a little bit older, I was watching Yu-Gi-Oh! Abridged, which is this really funny YouTube series where someone kind of dubs over the original uh, original anime, kind of making a parody of it. I totally remember that. Yeah, and so I, I was a big fan of that. And there was a... a a season of Yu-Gi-Oh! Abridged that, that the creator made that was based on this thing called Yu-Gi-Oh! Season Zero, which is apparently this original season of Yu-Gi-Oh! that never was aired in the West because it was not appropriate for children. So just hearing that made me really interested in it. So I looked it up and, and watched it. And since it never was aired in the West, there was no dub. The only thing available was the original Japanese version with English subtitles. And it was watching that show that just yeah, it made me have this epiphany that I wanted to learn Japanese. But the show itself wasn't particularly good. Like, I wouldn't recommend it. It's kind of cliche and repetitive. But uh, it does have a kind of distinct 90s vibe in terms of the aesthetic and the music and stuff like that. Something we ask a lot of our guests that are not from New Orleans or the New Orleans area, um, you know, before we jump too deep into whatever the topic may be for the day, um, what is your connection to New Orleans? Have you ever been before? And if you have, what is your fondest or funniest or most unique memory? But if you haven't, um, you know, if someone says New Orleans, like what, what is the first thing that pops into your mind? Yeah, I've never been to New Orleans. Don't really know anything about it. Uh, I mean, even, you know, just what, what image comes to my mind, I really, not much. Uh, but just coincidentally, actually, the other day, I uh, found this song called House of the Rising Sun. That, that I liked. Uh, it was playing at the grocery store. I, I uh, shazammed it and found it. And I feel like I've heard it somewhere before as well. But I'm pretty sure that song mentions New Orleans and it's about New Orleans. So now that that's what came to mind. So so we're going to be your first thought when you think of New Orleans going forward. Probably, yeah. <laughs> this podcast. Wow. Oh, there you go. Setting, yes. setting the tone. Setting the tone. Oh, God. No pressure, guys. And uh, Matt, just when we were talking and you were saying... Um, you responded to my initial email. You were saying how you came back from a meditation retreat recently. I'm interested in kind of knowing what made you study meditation. Yeah, well, I mean, that's a whole rabbit hole uh, to go down. But I've been interested in meditation for a couple of years now, maybe actually like three, four years now since I initially got interested in it. And ever since I first heard about meditation, I always found it interesting uh, you know, the idea that just how you could work out your muscles and get physically stronger, you could do a practice that would train your mind and make your mind stronger or clearer or somehow in, improve it in some way. Uh, as soon as I heard about that, I'm like, well, if that's possible, then of course I want to do that. And so, yeah, I've been meditating in, a, in many different traditions and learning more about it. And it's a really interesting world that, uh, yeah, it's a really deep rabbit hole to go down. But yeah, this, so in terms of meditation retreats, this was the fourth retreat that I've been on, and it was in a pretty different style. I mean, the fact that uh, the pandemic is happening makes almost all meditation retreats on Zoom. But this particular one I, I did with a couple friends. So I actually went to a friend's house and kind of stayed with, with a couple friends, and we did it together. So although it was on Zoom, I still got to have a little bit of the uh, traditional retreat experience of going to somewhere else, being in a different environment, and, you know, being taken totally out of the context of your everyday life, which uh, outside of meditation, I think can just be really useful, you know, to, uh, to take a kind of vacation, but in a way it's not a vacation. Cause I think when you, most vacations, if you're going to like say, well, I'm going to go to a foreign country for a vacation, it's not very re rejuvenative in general, you know, it, it can be a really exhausting experience to go and, and go to a foreign country and have all these uh, really impactful experiences. It can be a really good positive experience, but it's not 
uh, really good for, I don't know, maybe processing things that are going on in your everyday life, getting a new perspective on your everyday life. So yeah, to go and kind of take some time to just reflect and not be very stimulated and, and really just introspect, I think is, is really powerful and going to be useful to everyone outside of actual meditation practices. And of course, actually practicing meditation practices has many benefits like improving your concentration and uh, your awareness of your thoughts and emotions and, and things like this. So yeah, I, I would recommend looking into it to anyone who is interested, but also, yeah, beware, it's a deep rabbit hole and uh, it's, it's not, not as, not as simple as work out your muscles and get stronger, unfortunately, but that's awesome. Yeah, it's really fascinating. Oh, yeah. I'm glad you had that opportunity and that you're finding, you know, new uh, new things to dive into. You know, that's awesome. I love that. Um, so you did a recent video that I found pretty fascinating, honestly, um, about fluency in Japanese. So my question is, you know, there are a lot of misconceptions and controversies about, you know, what it means to be fluent in a language. So my question is, what are your thoughts, Matt, on, you know, what makes a person fluent? Well, my thoughts are that the word fluent or fluency is just a word. Everyone has a different definition. And I don't really care that much about trying to converge on some ultimate definition on what fluency means. Uh, what's interesting is the reality, you know, and we can talk about the reality of different levels of language ability without coming up with some arbitrary line in the sand where if you're past this threshold, you now like get some badge where you're fluent. And so, you know, you're, you're special or something. I mean, uh, everyone's going to draw that line at different places and language ability is so multidimensional that, you know, I, I don't really think it, it makes sense to necessarily try to just draw one line and say, if you're past this line, then you're somehow, you know, have beat the game of language learning, basically. So yeah, for, for, uh, for me personally, I mean, I have to use the word fluent in my videos because people care about it. You know, if you're not, it's kind of built in as the, the goal of language learning, the equivalent of beating the elite four in like a Pokemon game. So you can't get around talking about it, but still, so I'm, I'm kind of just going along with it because it's such a pain to try to really avoid that word altogether. But in my head, I'm like, I don't, I don't care what what it really means. Yeah, I had a moment when I used to work at my old um, workplace and, you know, the news spread that I was studying Japanese. And down here, that's uh, kind of odd. You know, you don't hear many people say, oh, you know, this person's studying Japanese. So at my old work, you know, it was very, um, I guess they found that interesting. So every time, like, they would find out that I was studying Japanese, they were always like, the first thing they would say is, oh, does that mean you're fluent in Japanese? And I'm just like, I, I didn't know how to respond to that because I'm like, you automatically think, you know, you if you set up like a timeline, it's like, oh, you're studying Japanese. Automatically, they go to fluent. And I don't know how they got there. Like, there's there's so much to do in between those two yeah, things. Yeah. That just I'm flabbergasted. Well. Yeah, I mean, I think the way that fluency is used in our general culture is based on a false premise, which is that language ability is a binary. It's either yes or no. Uh, in a way, I think they think of language ability actually kind of going back to the Pokemon riff. They think of it as kind of like the evolution of a Pokemon. Like it's like first you're uh, like Pikachu and then you can evolve into Raichu and then you're fluent. So it's like that's it's kind of like a linear they think of it as like this linear path with clear chunks it's like okay you're a beginner and then you're and then you're fluent and then maybe if they have a little more nuance then there's also a native level above that or something but uh, they, they've never really sat down and, and thought about like how many different aspects of language ability there are uh the how it's a whole spectrum there's so many different gradients you know you can be able to do some things but not other things you could be competent in some domains but but not others you could be you know, really good at expressing yourself, but have bad grammar. You could have, you know, uh, perfect grammar, but awful pronunciation. You could be able to speak really well, but not read and write or the reverse. So I think they've just never thought about it. And if you sat down and talked about it with them for maybe even five minutes, they'd realize that they have no idea what they're talking about. But until someone does that to them, they're going to continue to just think that language ability is this very simple binary thing that it's really not. 
Yeah, that's something to really consider. I think I think you're right about that. I, I tried to sit down with them and talk, but I love how you make these Pokemon references because it's so funny. We just did a Pokemon episode. So oh, nice. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> Well, in uh, actually, it, what you said about the multidimensional nature of language uh, and like how you can be fluent in some ways, but not in others, or I shouldn't say fluent because that's like the whole point of what we're talking about. But <laughs> like you said, it's ingrained. Um, it makes me think of our own relationships with our primary language and how complex those are and how we fail to kind of like make that parallel that jump that like oh I can have that same complex kind of relationship with that I have with my own language with literally any language that I could possibly learn you know yeah I think that's a really good point and actually that's all another kind of related fallacy that I think even some uh, experienced language learners problem too which is thinking that native speakers are perfect at their language and there's no room for improvement and they're all roughly the same level like this term native level gets thrown around a lot in language learning conversations as if it's like a single a singular thing that it's just like yeah natives are at native level and if you're at native level then you're as good as a native when in reality every native has a different strengths and weaknesses and some natives are far better than others like if you're you know a professional writer like you know you're Hemingway you're like way better at writing than the average person you know un incompar incomparable otherwise the, you know anyone could be a professional writer, right? If all natives have the same level, some people are better at public speaking, other people can at all. Uh, some people are good at expressing themselves, other, others aren't. So uh, that's a, and even on basic things like knowledge of, of vocabulary, people who read a lot tend to know a lot more words than people who don't read a lot. So yeah, there's a huge range of ability uh, and, you know, in all different dimensions among native speakers as well. But that's something that a lot of native, uh, a lot of language learners overlook, I think. Amen. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's really like a lot of moving targets you set for yourself too. Um, you know, and when you're first starting to study, I mean, you may have the, the goal of just learning hiragana and then you're like, oh, now I can read. Now I need to learn words. <laughs> you know, like mm -hmm. um, it's it just, it's, I mean, to me, I, the word fluency, I mean, if people ask me that, I'm like, I can get by. <laughs> like I can, I can convey the thought I need to and that's all that matters to me. I mean, sure, it may not be the best way. And if it isn't, I'd like to learn the right, the you know, the better way. But in in the in the now, when I'm talking to somebody, as long as I can convey that thought, that's the most important thing to me. Or at least if I can't, I could find a way to get to that point, uh, whether it's through roundabout descriptions or gestures or whatever. Yeah. So building on that a little bit, instead of this fluency tag you mentioned that there are kind of these pillars of understanding when it comes to language learning well yeah the most i think the most basic way to break up language ability is into well the, the largest distinction is comprehension versus output ability so comprehension is your ability to understand and then output is your ability to produce the language and then you could divide each each one of those into the spoken language versus the written language so that gives us four quadrants you could say of understanding written language reading ability and then speaking ability and writing ability. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, each one of those can have further aspects to it, like how, how grammatically accurate is your speech? How naturally do you phrase things? And you know, how, how native-like is your pronunciation? And then there's higher level things in terms of, uh, that might even be relevant to native speakers, like uh, can you, you know, use intonation patterns in such a way that your speech doesn't sound boring, but also doesn't sound too like cartoony and animated to the point where it's annoying, you know, uh, and can, can you not say um too much while you're speaking and things like this. There's many different things that you could tweak to improve your, your output. Uh, and then also in comprehension, this can be a, it tends to be a very domain specific thing, meaning that just because you can understand, you know, slice of life anime, that doesn't mean you can understand the news. And just because you can understand the news, that doesn't mean that you're going to be able to read a novel. You know, so comprehension is, I think, much more domain specific than and, and output as well. But it's it's more noticeable, I think. And actually, maybe, maybe that's not even the case. Yeah, they, even for all aspects of language, it it's, tends to be very domain specific. Different types of languages are used in different types of language is used in different contexts. And you have to build your proficiency up on a kind of per domain basis to end up with a really kind of well-rounded, comprehensive language ability. So we've been talking about fluency and i know it's 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 so hard to avoid the word in this context 
But one thing we really haven't gotten into detail about is how you reached the level that you're at today. Was there a breakthrough moment for you where you realized this method was really working for you? Well, yeah, there there are many moments that I can point to. But uh, another thing that I'll mention before I go into the details on that is that as you get better, your standards get higher. So there were points in my Japanese journey where I thought I was like pretty good. But in hindsight, I sucked at that point in time. But my standards were so low at the time that I, you know, I, I was kind of uh, not satisfied, but I, I thought I was better than I was. And at every point in my Japanese journey, I thought I was better than I really was. So chances are, I think I'm better than I really am now as well. And a couple of years from now, I'll look back and say like, oh, no, actually, I, you know, I, I couldn't see these blind spots in, in my ability or something. So, I mean, I think even the first time that I went to Japan, which was just on a three week trip about a year after I started studying Japanese the traditional way, uh, I actually, so just, yeah, to go give a little more detail on my personal journey. When I was a freshman in high school, I got interested in Japanese for two years after that, I just took classes. They had classes at my high school. And I also went to a local community college to take classes during the summer. Then I discovered alljapaneseallthetime.com, which is a, a really hardcore method. And I started that when I was a junior in high school. And I did that for five years. And that took me to uh, roughly my, my current level. So during that first two year period when I was doing traditional study, which uh, I would now consider to be very inefficient, uh, I, I was just taking classes, reading textbooks. I, was, uh, I had the opportunity to take a three week trip to Japan. And during that trip, I was better at speaking Japanese than my uh, my peers, my other classmates, because I actually paid attention in class and they didn't. They were just taking Japanese because it was like a, a there was a language requirement and they chose Japanese over Spanish because they liked anime. But they didn't actually care about trying to get good. They were just, you know, they just were doing it for the credit. So I actually paid attention in class. And because of that, I was able to speak better than they could. Now, what I was really doing was thinking in English and then using these grammar formulas that I had memorized to kind of like make a, a Japanese style English thought. And it was unnatural and it was probably didn't, didn't sound anything like normal Japanese to a Japanese person. Also, my pronunciation was awful and I was really slow. But at the time I was like, oh, I'm, I'm pretty badass. Like, look, I can actually like say some stuff. And my, my classmates, like they think I'm really good. Like they, they're, they're like asking me to like translate stuff for them because they, they almost learned nothing in their class. So even at that, at that point in time, I thought I was good when I really sucked, right? But then once I, I read the all Japanese all the time website, which was again, two years into my, my Japanese journey, that really kind of set my standards way higher because on the all Japanese all the time website, he was talking about, you know, getting confused for native on the phone and how, you know, that, that's what he set as his goal. And he kind of encouraged people to set that as their goal as well. So that was like a paradigm shift when I was like, oh, I was getting happy if I just could say something and be understood. But this is a, a much higher standard of like, can I say it so perfectly that they don't notice I'm not a foreigner? And once I took on that standard, it was immediately like, oh, I'm literally garbage right now. Like, I, I'm literally like, I want to become a millionaire and I have like 40 cents currently. Like, that, that was what it felt like. So, uh, you know, that, that was definitely very uh, sobering and uh, humbling. But uh, I remember around one year into learning Japanese, or, or actually, so to rewind, so all Japanese all the time, this website I've been mentioning, it's created by this guy who goes by the handle name Katsumoto. And he claims that he achieved fluency, again, his definition of fluency, uh, within 18 months while living in the United States and having part-time jobs and being busy. And he did this by just filling every single crack in his day with Japanese content and only hanging out with Japanese friends and only consuming Japanese content, No, like trying to remove as much English from his life as possible. And so when I discovered this website, I'm like, okay, this, this guy is badass. You know, he figured this language learning stuff out. I'm just going to try to replicate his experience as much as possible. So uh, I went to Japan and, uh, around when I was six months into my, my all Japanese all the time experience. And so this was the second time I went to Japan. It was supposed to be a 10 month study abroad. And I thought, okay, well, I'm six months in to my experience. Now, when I come back from Japan, 10 months later, I won't quite be at 18 months, you know, I'd be at 16 months, but I should be almost close to fluency by then because I'm just going to do what Katsumoto did and he got fluent in 18 months. So I remember when I first arrived in Japan, I bought all these Japanese light novels and at the time they were not comprehensible at all. But I remember thinking, oh, by the time I go back home from Japan, I'll be able to just read these like they're English. 
because I also was still very naive and basically just thought that, I, I mean, I still was falling into that delusion that language ability is a binary. And, you know, once you're quote unquote fluent, then you're pretty much just perfect and you've beat the game. And I thought that was only going to take me a year and a half. So I was super naive. And I just thought, yeah, I'm going to be able to read these and I'll know every single word and it'll be easy. So, you know, fast forward six months, I actually decided to leave Japan early. But when I was leaving Japan, I, I, by that point, so now I was one year into my all Japanese all the time experience because I had six months before going to Japan. I was in Japan for six months. I still couldn't read those books easily or even close to it, but I could, I was like far enough along where I could see that if I kept doing what I was doing, I would reach that point eventually. Like I, I had gained enough experience and enough ability that I kind of had a direct understanding of how the language acquisition process worked. And it was no longer just you know, an intellectual thing. It was no longer me understanding the ideas that Katsumoto wrote. It was me having a direct experience and having this, yeah, this firsthand direct knowledge of how the process worked. And by that point, I already had read a couple novels. And although it was still really difficult, I kind of saw like, yeah, the only path forward is continue learning words, continue getting comfortable with the grammar, continue exposing your brain to the language, and you just get better and better and better. So that was the first time uh, it was, yeah, I remember a moment coming back from Japan and realizing like, yeah, I was super naive to think that I would be able to perfectly read these books in 18 months. That's like not realistic at all, but it is, I have enough direct experience and it has worked enough where I can see that I'm on the path. I just need to keep doing what I'm doing. So that was the first time I really had this recognition of like, this works. I just need to to stick with it. And then about a year after I came back from Japan, so this would be two years of all Japanese all the time. I had this opportunity to be a tour guide for Japanese uh, college students that were visiting Portland, Oregon, where I live for just three weeks. And the job itself actually didn't require Japanese ability, but it just happened to be a good time to kind of test out my Japanese. And I found that I could have conversations with them pretty easily. I could express almost everything I wanted to express and I could understand them enough to the point where we could like really have conversations. And it didn't really feel like they had to dumb down their speech in order for me to understand like it did the first time I went to Japan, it was more natural. And, if, you know, there were moments where, you know, I even forgot I was speaking a foreign language, they probably forgot I was a foreigner, and we really got to connect. And so that was a huge confident boost. And that was the first time I, where I was like, I'm fluent. And in hindsight, I still sucked at that time, basically. But, uh, it, you know, I, I, by that point, I was far better than most foreigners ever get. And yeah, I, I I did have a sort of basic fluency because I could express everything I wanted to express and understand most basic things. Now, I was still making a lot of mistakes, saying unnatural stuff. You know, I never would have been even close to getting confused for a native speaker, but I could get the job done, so to speak. So that that was definitely a really big milestone. And I think if a lot of people were able to reach the level that I had at that point in time, they would be pretty happy. But then I can I came back home, went back into my cave, so to speak, and just started you know, or, or continued to listen to Japanese all day, read Japanese all day for another year. And then at the end of the three-year point of doing all Japanese all the time, I transferred into a three-year college. There was a lot of Japanese foreign exchange students at the college that I was going to, and they had kind of formed a, a community of Japanese people. And I started hanging out with them. And that was when the first time I started speaking Japanese on a regular basis. And by then I was significantly better than I was at that two-year mark. That, that extra year made a big difference. So by then I was a lot more comfortable and you know, uh, it, it, most of the, the Japanese students were blown away by my ability. They couldn't believe I'd only live in Japan for six months. They would like, when they would find out that I could read kanji, they'd be like, how is this possible? And they, they would try to like test me to find out the limits of my knowledge. Cause it, they like, just couldn't comprehend how I could have gotten to the point where I could read kanji. Cause it took them nine years to go to school, right? To read learn kanji. I'd only been doing this for a couple of years and I could, I could read novels already. So that was, was really great. Uh, and, you know, it, it was really gratifying. It felt like I did it. I'm a winner. But then I started to really kind of swing back around and hold myself to the standard of a native speaker. I started to kind of graduate from being like, I'm really good from a foreigner to thinking of it as like, well, I'm a Japanese speaker and I'm going to hold myself to the same standards that a Japanese person would hold themselves to when they're speaking Japanese. And that suddenly made me realize that actually I still suck on like a higher level. Because although I'm a god among foreigner, I'm still like an infant for a Japanese person. And so that I remember that was a really difficult transition because it just like when I when you I really started thinking like, OK, I want to get to the point where I'm literally as good as a Japanese person. There's just so many things to work on. 
so many aspects that, I, that I'd have to master, so many things to practice and learn. And it became really overwhelming, but I just stuck with it and did kind of two more years of just grinding it out, working on all my weak spots, getting better and better. And by that five-year mark, I definitely was not native level. I'm not at native level today. I think if I moved to Japan and spent like another 10 years living my whole life in Japanese, then I could probably reach native level. But uh, I did reach a level that is uh, like almost no foreigners reach. And I don't know anyone who's reached my level outside of Japan. And so I think also just going on YouTube and filming, you know, putting videos of myself speaking Japanese on YouTube and then getting so much recognition from both other Japanese learners and from Japanese people themselves was then another level of me realizing like, oh, maybe, maybe I am pretty good at this. Like, I know I still didn't hit my personal goal, which was become Japanese, but in terms of a foreigner, I'm kind of like almost God level. And so I did kind of, now I kind of try to hold both of those perspectives where of course I'm still humble. I still realize I'm nowhere close to native level and really I want to keep improving. But at the same time, I'm not Japanese. I'm a, an American who started learning Japanese like past puberty. And so it's a different experience. So I have to, I can't, you, you have to be happy with what you've been able to achieve and, and feel good about that. You can't always just, you know, poo poo everything that you do because it's not, it's not as good as it could be in the future, right? That's a recipe for being miserable. So I try to hold both those perspectives simultaneously. No, that's a really important perspective to have, you know, and remaining humble. And uh, I can, I can only imagine, you know, that especially when you have a YouTube channel, you're probably receiving comments all the time of people saying, Oh my God, I, I wish I was at your Japanese level. You're so good. I, et cetera, et cetera, you know, so, um, remaining humble is key and, uh, and hats off to you for, you know, really striving to maintain that. Now, here's another question for you. Did meditation help with that mindset? Uh, yeah, I mean, it definitely did. It helped me. I mean, it helped me, it helped me especially with letting go of my expectations of, you know, oh, I'm not native level, therefore I'm a failure. Cause that's the standard I hold, I held myself for two for so long. And when I actually started meditating, I noticed I had a lot of really unhealthy habits where like when I was watching an anime or a Japanese movie and I didn't understand something, I would kind of have a little mini freak out and be like, what, how, like, what? Why don't I understand this? And I'd, and I'd have to like come up with some explanation to myself of like, oh, well maybe uh, that, that, that was like a really rare word and even a Japanese person would have understood that. Or like, oh, uh, I'm just tired right now. Or like, oh, my headphones are like, uh, they have problems with the sound quality, that's why I missed it. Or something like that. And when I started meditating and having more awareness of my, my thoughts and emotions, I just realized like, oh, this is so neurotic. Like, so what? I didn't understand something. Even in English, I don't understand stuff sometimes. And I realized I didn't have to go through any of that, uh, that process of like feeling bad and trying to come up with an explanation. I could, I could just drop that and just be with whatever my experience was in the moment. And being able to do that made, uh, well, first of all, it probably helped me get better at Japanese because the, all of those thoughts are actually just taking you out of paying attention to what's going on in the Japanese. And it also made being me a lot less painful. So, yeah. Yeah. Now my next question, you did kind of just answer here, but I, I want to pose it to you formally. And that is dealing with ambiguity when learning a language. Now you've written about this. Katsumoto also wrote about this, but when you are, when you are learning a language, how do you deal with not understanding what's in front of you and the frustration that that brings. Yeah, well, I'd say when, when I was learning Japanese, I was so enthusiastic and gung-ho about it that tolerating the ambiguity wasn't really an issue. I just sat and watched anime that I understood close to nothing of for hours on end. And, and in fact, there were times where I'd watch a TV show, not understand it, but just kind of like make up the story in my head and then believe that I understood it. And then I'd go back and watch the show three years later and realize that actually I hadn't understood it at all. So when I was learning Japanese, I was just basically so enthusiastic that it wasn't an issue. But then I, I, a couple of years ago, I started trying to learn Chinese and I found it much more difficult because I was used to understanding almost everything with Japanese. So going to Chinese and then going back to understanding nothing was actually really difficult. And it's taken me a, a few tries. I've kind of like started and stopped Chinese a bunch of times. And it's only in the last year that I've really started to be more consistent about it. And I found that meditation definitely helps and, you know, having the right expectations and things like that, that really helps, but also just very practical things. Like uh, I decided I'm only going to 
for now, I'm only watching Japanese drama, or sorry, Chinese dramas with Chinese subtitles, because that's the way that I understand the most. Uh, I, I know the characters from Japanese, so I can understand a lot when the subtitles are there. And combined with the, all the, the times that I started and stopped studying Chinese for various periods of time, I had gotten to the point where I could watch a, a Chinese drama with Chinese subtitles and like fo actually follow the plot and enjoy the story. So I decided, well, I'm just going to do that. I'm not going to worry about watching without subtitles for now because it's too boring. I don't understand enough. And I'm not going to try to read fully because I, st I also don't understand enough where without the visual support, I can, I can really follow along. There's still too much I don't know. So I'm just going to stick with the, the format that I found that is actually entertaining for me. And I will like often pause and look words up. That allows me to understand the story. And then it becomes an enjoyable experience. So I think you do have to change things around and find what works for you. Find something that actually is engaging because, I mean, meditation definitely helps, but it, it's not this magic pill that will allow you to have infinite willpower and, and put up with stuff that you hate for, you know, more than a short period of time. So I have a quick question. You've talked about kind of how this this bar has has changed for you over the course of learning Japanese. You know, like you start at a certain level thinking, uh, this is my goal. And then you get to that goal and you realize that, you know, <laughs> there's this whole other world that you haven't even seen yet. Um, do you have any recommendations for where somebody should set their own goals if they're coming at it from a beginner level? Well, I, I think one way to think about it is what role do you want Japanese to play in your life going forward? Mm. Because I like that. Reframing yeah. The, the thing about language ability is that it's not a static thing. You can get really good, but if you don't put in the, the continuous work of maintaining that level of ability, you're going to get worse and worse and worse. So it's not this matter of like, I'm going to hit this, this peak point of ability and then retire because I beat the game, right? It, you have to continually spend time with Japanese to maintain your ability. So that's why I think you have to think about what, what role do you want Japanese to play in your life? Do you want to spend like one hour every day in Japanese for the rest of your life? Two hours, three hours? Do you want to spend half of all your life in Japanese? Do you want to move to Japan, spend the majority of your life in Japanese? Because, uh, I, or, or do you kind of want to maybe learn Japanese and then be like, been there, done that, and then let it go. And then go back to spending most of your time in, in English or another language. And then, you know, when you go to a sushi restaurant, you can like have a little chat with the, the bartender or, or the chef and be like, oh yeah, I studied Japanese. So like, that was fun. And have it be more like a memory of the past. So if you, if you kind of have this sense of like, I want to, learn Japanese so that I can see what the world looks like through that view and check that off my list and then move on with my life, then you don't necessarily need that high of a level. And there's not really that, that much of a point of getting to like that high of a level. So, and then I think, yeah, you, you can have pretty moderate standards and maybe, maybe set goals of something concrete you want to be able to do. Like I want to be able to have a 15 minute conversation with a Japanese stranger. And once you do that, then you know, you've achieved your goal. But if you really want Japanese to continue to be a part of your life going forward for the rest of your life, then I think it's worth really pursuing a high level of ability because if you're going to be spending, let's say, like an hour a day in Japanese for the rest of your life, the better you are at Japanese, the better that that hour that you spend in Japanese is going to be every single day. You know, the, because the more you understand, the clearer you understand, uh, the better your experience is going to be. You don't want to be, end up feeling like every day you're spending an hour in Japanese, but really it would be better to spend it in English because you would understand it clearer if it was in English. And it's just an extra pain that you don't understand it quite as well. That was, that's like what, what uh, I would personally never want that. So I think, yeah, if you really know that you think you want Japanese to be part of your life going forward, then it's worth setting in a way uh, a, a high, as high a standard as you can so that you eventually get to the point where it doesn't feel like a burden, the fact that you in a way have to continue to spending time in Japanese to maintain your ability. Absolutely. I think that's a really great. Do you feel that people need to know a certain amount of Japanese in order to go to Japan? And if so, like, how much should someone know? I mean, you definitely don't have to know any Japanese to go to Japan. And the evidence for this is that there are many foreigners who have been living in Japan for like 10 plus years and hardly know any Japanese at all. In fact, uh, when I was doing my study abroad in Japan, the six month one, there was a, a couple English teachers, like American English teachers at my college. And I remember one of them in particular knew less Japanese than me at the time. And he had been living in Japan, in Japan for 10 years. And he had a Japanese wife and half Japanese kids. And all his other friends were Americans who were living in Japan. 
And anytime he had to do paperwork or anything like that, his wife would do it for him, his Japanese wife who also spoke English. And so, yeah, you, if you, uh, you can live in Japan and almost and get by almost no problem knowing almost no Japanese. And so if you're talking about being a tourist or just taking a vacation, you definitely I don't think you need to know any Japanese. Like that's on a lot of people's mind and probably like one of the reasons why a lot of people, you know, don't take you know, the step to actually go to Japan because they're so terrified of, oh my gosh, I don't know the language and I've been wanting to go to Japan all my life, but you know, this one thing is stopping me. Well, I mean, I would say that I think a lot of people, they want to learn Japanese and they feel that they have to go to Japan to learn Japanese when that's definitely not true. And in fact, I think it's, it might be the, the ideal time to, to go to Japan is after you already have a basic level of fluency in Japanese, in my opinion, because when in my method of studying, you first focus on building up your comprehension before you start focusing on speaking and writing. And this is actually how we learned our native language, right? We spent uh, like a couple of years doing nothing but listening all the time. And then we started using the language our, our, ourselves. So uh, when, if we're talking about getting good at understanding, it's you can use media and that will be just as effective, perhaps more effective than trying to use real life people, right? Because if we're talking about media, like an anime, you can pause, you can rewind, you can look things up, you can watch the same thing over and over. Can't do that for a real life person, you know? And, and in fact, there's and then social etiquette starts to come, come in, you know, plays a role. And it makes it harder to just focus on understanding the language. So I think it's actually better to build a foundation in the language outside of Japan using media, and then go to Japan once you have basic fluency, because then write off the bat, you'll be able to actually participate in Japanese culture, make Japanese friends, and have a more meaningful experience. Whereas if you arrive in Japan not knowing Japanese, well, you're going to end up making friends with, you're not going to be able to make friends with real Japanese people who speak Japanese. You, you'll only make friends with Japanese people who speak English, and you'll probably make even more friends with just other people from your home country. And once you get into the habit of maneuvering Japan without Japanese and hanging out with other foreigners, it's going to be really hard to break out of that cycle and actually start um, participating in the actual Japanese society. So I would say it's better to just get to the point where right off the bat, when you arrive in Japan, you can build those habits of integrating yourself into, into Japanese culture to a certain degree the first time. That's some good advice. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I fully agree. I, you know, I had friends that when I was living over there, didn't speak a lick of Japanese and they have been there for a good bit of time. So it's definitely something that, if you try, you can, <laughs> but if you don't have the desire to, or if you surround yourself with uh, people who aren't speaking Japanese, then you're probably not going to pick up on things that you may, if you work in a Japanese work environment or travel in circles that have Japanese speakers. So I totally agree. But I, I did have a question for you in terms of maybe something a little more light, lighthearted, um, you know, a, a mistake maybe that you made in Japanese where you were like, you didn't realize you're making it and, you know, maybe it was something embarrassing or funny or, you know, slipped up on words or, or something like that. You know, that's always a learning experience on its own. Um, a, a unique way. I, I like to learn from my own mistakes because I make plenty of mistakes. So, <laughs> um, you know, do you have a time that maybe sticks out in your mind where you maybe made the mistake in Japanese that, you know, it's like, okay, I made that mistake. I'm never going to forget it. I mean, I actually I have a video on my channel uh, where I talk about some Japanese mistakes that I okay. make, and it's actually a video I made with a friend, and that friend made way worse mistakes than me. He has some super embarrassing mistakes. So I, I recommend checking out that video. It's really funny. It's called like our most embarrassing Japanese mistakes. For me personally, I I've definitely made lots of mistakes, but n not very many in particular stick out in my mind. I just think because you know there wasn't really a funny story behind them. I just said something, and I'm like, huh, what? And then I'm like, uh, what? Oh, oh, did I make a mistake? And then I look it up, and then. I realized, oh yeah, no, it's, 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 I, you know, I pronounced one vowel wrong and then they understood. So it's like not very exciting. Um, there are, uh, there was actually a couple of times where I used a word that a Japanese person didn't know because uh, at one point in my Japanese journey, I was reading a lot of novels and novels use a lot of obscure vocabulary that never gets used in real life. But I didn't really know that. I kind of just figured it's like, well, if I know the word, then surely a Japanese person knows it, right? Like I've seen this two, three times in different novels. So in, you know, Japanese people must know it. And I used the word and they're like, huh? And then I'm like, oh, crap, did I pronounce it wrong? And I looked it up on my phone and showed it to them. And they're like, I've never heard of that before. So that was like a real yeah, <laughs> wake up call of like, oh, Japanese people aren't like necessarily, 
you know, they're not a dictionary. Yeah. Yeah. They're not, they're not, they don't know everything. <laughs> so there's definitely that. Yeah. And, uh, Actually, the, the funny thing is, I don't, I don't actually remember the exact context. I remember the, something that really sticks out of my mind was one time I was with a group of Japanese friends and I tried to make a joke that I thought was funny and they didn't laugh at all. And then one of the one of the girls like was specifically said, like, like, that's cringe. In Japanese. <laughs> and, I, and, and I remember I just wanted to kill myself like that felt so awful. I don't actually remember what the content of the joke was. Um, yeah, but that was that's also an interesting thing that can happen where uh, when if you're kind of mediocre at Japanese and you hang out with Japanese people, they're not going to view you as a Japanese person. They're going to view you as a foreigner and they're going to really cut you a lot of slack. So you can make mistakes, but they'll still say like, oh, wow, you're so good at Japanese. And, you know, they'll laugh at all your jokes and, and they'll like really hype you up. But if, if you get to a really high level, then they'll start, they'll stop, you know, giving you all these free passes basically. And uh, you like, I, I remember at that time that that was, it really hit me like, oh, I got to be like this. I am now getting held to a high standard and that's what I thought I wanted, but there's actually some negative consequences. Cause you know, for example, you make a bad joke and, and then they make fun of you or they, they just cringe at you. So. That's so funny. I was actually like literally crying. <laughs> um, but like I said, I, I hear a lot of people like talking about learning Japanese and like the equivalent of like going to Japan. So I'm going to kind of keep on nudging at that because just I get so many comments on that. You know, do you believe that immersion is the best way to learn the language? And do you feel I know we kind of said it, but like, do you feel like you have to go to Japan in order to accomplish this kind of language learning? Or do you feel like there's a way to efficiently get it done without going to Japan, honestly. Well, so the word immersion is used in a couple of different ways. The most traditional probably connotation of immersion was to go to the country and completely surround yourself in a, a physical environment that's filled with, with uh, that language. But the way that I use the word immersion, and this kind of comes from Katsumoto, is, is really just another word for spending time with your target language. So if you sit and watch a Japanese movie for two hours with no subtitles, I call that two hours of, of, of Japanese immersion in the sense of you, you're immersing yourself in the language for those two hours. So, uh, and, you know, I, I used to be a part of an approach called the mass immersion approach. Now in my new method refold, we, we still talk about Im immersion a lot. And, and so maybe a, another way to put it is input-based learning. So that kind of comes from Stephen Krashen. And it's the idea that most of your learning is not explicit in the sense of you're like consciously memorizing uh, facts about the language, but it's implicit learning where through exposing yourself to the language for a large amount of time, your unconscious mind figures out how it works and you just kind of intuitively start to, to get it more and more in a similar way that, that you understand your native language. So in that sense, immersion or input is not only the best way to get good at a language, it's the only way to actually get good at a language. Anyone who's gotten good at any language got there through exposing themselves to that language for thousands of hours. There's no way around it. Now, some people did that immersion through media, like myself, like they sat and watched like hundreds of anime and dramas and movies and read books. Other people, they just went to the country and the immersion was through real life conversation. It was for through actually, you know, hearing a Japanese person say something that had never been said before, like to their face. But either way, language is such a like, hyper specific thing that there's no way to speak like a native unless you know how natives speak. And there's no way to know how natives speak without listening to natives speak for thousands of hours. You can't read a simplification or a general principle about how natives some like tend to speak a lot of the time in a textbook and then get away with that. It's just you know, language is way too exact for that. It would be like you're the equivalent of like, you want to draw a picture of a dog, but you've never seen a dog before. You've just read a written description of a dog in a textbook and then you're trying to draw it. It's like, you're never, maybe you get to, you get close enough where someone else can look at the picture and know you're trying to draw a dog, but it's never going to be good. You know, it's the same, that, that's basically what people are doing when they use textbooks and they try to learn through this method of thinking in English and then translating their thoughts into Japanese using a formula that they memorized in a Japanese textbook. Uh, you know, you have to actually just hear natives say things in uh, hundreds, thousands of different contexts over and over again to really grasp an intuition for the, how a language is used and how various things feel from a native person's perspective, the sensibilities of language. You have to kind of absorb the intuition of, of that through thousands of hours. So that's kind of, yeah, covering the question of like, do is immersion effective? Yes. Now, 
I give the caveat of immersion is not only the most effective, but the only way to get good. And of course, good is kind of like fluency, very uh, subjective and relative. Uh, but my my definition of good, um, which is you know you can you can get stuff done in the language, you could get a job in the language, you could get educated in the language, you can watch anime comfortably without subtitles. So if that is your goal, yeah, you need immersion, you need input. But if you just want to go to Japan and be able to like have a basic conversation or like ask for directions, you know, uh, do a self introduction, then immersion is kind of overkill for that. You could just memorize some formulas, memorize some phrases, and then use the phrases. Now that's going to be very limited, but if that is your goal, then you know that's the that's the best way to do that. So if you're really just looking for some survival level phrases, then you can just get a phrase book and memorize those, or you know read through the the first couple chapters of a Japanese textbook. But yeah, if you want to get good, you need immersion. Now in terms of being in the country or not, it 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 doesn't matter at all because like I said, um, there are people who have lived in Japan for literally over a decade. They don't speak Japanese at all. So living in in Japan. Obviously, isn't a surefire way to learn Japanese. And then there's people like Katsumoto who reached a really high level in Japanese without stepping foot in Japanese once. And I've interviewed multiple people on my YouTube channel who've reached fluency in Japanese. Fluency, my definition. Uh, they've gotten pretty good at Japanese without having got, ever gone to Japan. I spent six months in Japan, but when I got back from Japan, I still sucked at Japanese, and I only got good outside of Japan. And most of my experience didn't even involve hanging out with real life Japanese people. It was just oh, oh, watching lots of anime, putting the anime on my phone, listening to it all day, listening to Japanese podcasts, Japanese YouTube videos, reading Japanese novels, watching Japanese movies, all of that I got through the internet. So yeah, it's it's definitely possible as long as you have an internet connection. Uh, and, and in fact, it's not even necessarily helpful to be in Japan for that first period of time, because like I said, before you have a basic level of ability, you can't even have a conversation, right? You don't know how to say anything and you can't understand them when they talk back to you. So when it comes to learning the basics, it's not going to matter whether your physical body happens to be in Japan or not, because the activities you're going to be doing are going to be exactly the same. So I'd say if you're kind of telling yourself this narrative that you can't learn Japanese because you're not in Japan or you need to go to Japan to learn Japanese, I'd say that's just a limiting belief. And the type of person who can't teach themselves the basics of Japanese outside of Japan is probably the same type of person who's going to go to Japan and still not be able to learn Japanese, which is actually the majority of people who move to Japan, right? The reality, which is sad, but it's just the reality, I think it's important for people to be aware of, is that the majority of foreigners who move to Japan never get good at Japanese. Instead, get good at getting by in Japan with crappy Japanese. That's the skill that they cultivate, which is a different skill. You know, it's, it's, it's true, though, man. I, I, I totally hear that because they they you have to really put yourself down and have discipline to really kind of focus on where your weaknesses are and identifying those weaknesses and being willing to accept that you're not good and you have to have the patience to to build that that build that confidence because confidence is a really big part of learning a language because you can learn all the stuff in the books you want but if you don't have the confidence to go out and talk to vo vocalize those thoughts that you may have that or you know face the uh, face this potential situation where you may not understand the person that you're talking to or they may say something that you don't you didn't really encounter yet or something how do you adapt and being able to adapt to that is uh you know i think it is a crucial skill as part of that and that actually kind of leads into our next question um about adaptability um and it's kind of a twofold thing here uh the first part is you know with traveling to a new country, you've, like you said, you've been to Japan twice, you know, culture shock is a natural thing. It's going to happen anytime you relocate somewhere. Um, especially when moving to, from, from the U S to Japan, I know me personally, I had my own, you know, things and I think everybody has, um, but what was one of the, the biggest culture shock moments for you when you went over to Japan the first time, or even, you know, home, your first time was a homestay or was it yeah, kind of like, yeah, it was a homestay. Okay. I mean, the, the three weeks, by my three week trip to Japan, the initial one, mm -hmm. I wouldn't say I experienced any, uh, any culture shock just because it was so short and right. I was only experiencing all the best aspects of Japan, really. Yeah. <laughs> but in my second trip, the six month one, I definitely experienced a lot of culture shock. I think it actually hit me harder because I was convinced that, you know, I wasn't going to experience culture shock because I already understood Japanese culture and I was right. like so prepared because I had been doing all Japanese all the time. So I think it even hit me harder because of that arrogance that I was going into it with. 
and I mean, it, it's been a while now, so it's hard to remember really vividly what the individual things were, but I, I think it was just a lot of small things like, yeah. um, that realizing that, yeah, the scenery in Japan looks very similar to anime, but the, the actual way that Japanese people tend to live their day-to-day -day life is not anything like anime. You know, they're very serious. Um, they're like, I think just how they were like in a way, Japanese people tend to, uh, like when you're talking to a stranger, when you talk to someone in public, they're very kind of closed off. They have this kind of surface level appearance that they put forward and you have to get really close with somebody before they'll, they'll be more authentic with you. And they'll, they'll kind of take down this kind of like public facing armor that they have up. And or of you course, get drunk. what's that? Or you get them drunk. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but unfortunately I was 16 at the time. So oh, never that, mind. <laughs> uh, that wasn't open to me. Um, actually funny story. The first time I ever got drunk was when, uh, my host family like gave me, uh, sake when I was in Japan and that was one of my few good memories actually, uh, when I was in Japan, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I think, yeah, just, just all, all these little things like, um, yeah, yeah. How people didn't feel as friendly. They feel felt kind of closed off and, 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 uh, like my host, I actually, I didn't have one host family every couple of months. I switched to a different host family. And all the host families that I went to had a, a, a child that was going to my high school, but just because it would have been expensive to house and, and provide food for a foreign exchange student for an entire year, different families took on like the, that, that job for like two months at a time. So my first host family, actually, I didn't like at all. It was a, a single mom who basically I, I would be pretty confident to say only agreed to have me come as a foreign exchange student because she was going to get like money from the program for doing so. So she just did it to get some extra cash. She didn't like me. She didn't yeah. really care about me. Uh, she didn't really have any intention of making me have a good experience. Like she actually was a landlord for the, it was like a, a three story apartment complex. They lived in the third, the third story and they also owned like the, I don't know if they're owned or rented. I don't know what the details were, but basically they were renting out the second story to uh, high schoolers who were coming from a different prefecture to go to high, to high school. And so I was living in that second floor with two other high schoolers that were from different prefectures. And then only during mealtime would I go up to the, the third story where that where her and my host brother actually lived. And so I was really not getting treated as a family member at all. I was getting treated as um, like a as a tenant. Yeah, as a, yeah, exactly. And I thought I thought you were going to say they were going to give you the Harry Potter treatment and stick you in. The <laughs> not not that bad. <laughs> uh, basically, the bare minimum where I couldn't complain to my program is what they were doing. But uh, yeah, actually, there were times where for breakfast she would give me like like just bread, like pan from the from the convenience store, and then my host brother would actually get like miso soup and like and like chicken and stuff and she'd be like well he plays sports so he needs the extra energy you don't play any you're not in a club so you don't need it. you're like you don't need it and uh were, stuff like were you in tokyo or i was where in were gunma you prefecture your... gunma okay which is like a couple hours outside of tokyo but also yeah. kind of the middle of nowhere so like yeah i think that also was just very dissolutioning uh because it was the opposite of the experience that i had uh during my three-week trip where my, my my host family from that three-week trip was very hospitable you know, very, you know, they treated me really nicely. We really connected. It was really sad when I had to say goodbye to them. So here I just had the opposite experience where even my host mom would totally make, make fun of me in a bunch of ways for like wow. being a nerd and like not, uh, not being like my, <laughs> my host brother was actually. So that always just pissed me off and was really annoying. And, uh, yeah, that, that, that was what started off my experience in Japan uh, on a pretty, pretty sour note. So I remember yeah, just thinking like, insane, Oh, this is so right? dark. Yeah, yeah, this is nothing at all like the anime world that I was envisioning. A, a buddy of mine in college, actually, when I did the study abroad year, I stayed in a Japanese dorm um, that was, had some association with the university I went to, but it was a privately owned dorm. Um, and but they had other opportunities for you to do homestay or, or, you know, get an apartment. I guess you had different avenues to pick. I went the dorm route. My buddy went uh, the homestay route. And he had, uh, again, something similar to you where he had an it was it was a couple, but it was an elderly couple that basically, like you said, accepted the homestay student because they were getting paid to take in like mm -hmm. a foreign exchange. But they were very cold to him. They treated him really badly. Um, he had a really, really, really negative experience and actually forced his way out of that homestay into an apartment situation. He had to get out like he couldn't do it. Otherwise, he's, he was going to bolt back and leave. 
So, um, so he pushed, uh, he pushed and pushed and got out of that situation. But it's unfortunate that, that, you know, that that is the exposure that these, uh, you know, that exchange students may get if they accept to or get placed in a homestay that doesn't really, you know, really want yeah, a, it, an exchange student to come live with them. Yeah, it's a real mixed bag. It's, it's really a gamble because if you uh, end up with a host family that, that is that you do mesh really well with and, and are like actually interested in bonding with with someone from a different country, then it can be an amazing experience, right? And it can help you build a really strong connection to Japan. Uh, but the opposite can happen as well. So yeah, yeah, I had, I think, in total, four different host families, and one of them was really cool. And that's good. That, that was the one that got me drunk. Uh, <laughs> probably not, not a coincidence. So that, that was, you know, my I actually only got to stay with them for like a month. But that was by far my best month in, in Japan. They were super chill. And just it felt like they got me, you know, like they understood me, they like tried to look at things from my point of view, not just push their perspective onto me. And yeah, I was just yeah re really grateful to them. So at least it wasn't all bad. So so despite all of your, um, not I don't say negative, but like not ideal. Uh, Pretty negative. Yeah, Pretty I guess, negative. yeah, I guess it had yeah, a negative is an appropriate word. Uh, all those negative experiences, do you ever see yourself relocating to Japan for work or like trying to go on through some kind of exchange program a la oh, yeah, it's, or it's, something else, you know, opportunities are It's out definitely there. something that, that I think about a lot. I mean, I mean, the real thing was, why did I continue to study Japanese after I got back from that awful experience? And that is a more interesting uh, and, and hard to answer question I can talk about. But in terms of answering the question you just uh, asked, it's like, well, now if I went to Japan, like I actually speak Japanese. I understand the culture much better than, than I did at the time. And if I did go, I'd, I definitely want to not be with the host family and not be going to school and not be, you know, uh, handled by a program that limits my, my freedoms and stuff. I, I want to be totally free and I would be if I went to Japan. So I, I think that would be a totally different experience and imagine it would be a good time. So I definitely want to at least take a trip to Japan. And, you know, I, I probably would have taken one last year if it wasn't for the pandemic. So once travel opens up more, I'll probably take a trip to Japan and then I'll decide if I want to, you know, maybe relocate for a period of time after that. So it's definitely a possibility I think about, but I don't have any uh, strong plans either way yet. That's exciting. So Matt, I'm curious to know, why did you continue studying Japanese after that that bad experience? Yeah, I'm, I'm super interested. Yeah, yeah, I think many of us probably would have given up after coming back from that. Yeah, well, I think, uh, the, I think probably uh, the, there's probably two things at play. One of them was that <clears throat> I think part of the, initial reason that I got into Japanese, and I only realized this very later, very much later on, I didn't, I wasn't aware of it at all during the time. But I think one of the reasons why I got so interested in Japanese was because I wanted a new identity. At high school, like actually in middle school, I had a group of friends I was really close with, you know, I was in kind of the, the popular kid group, because at the time, skateboarding was popular, and I had gotten decent at skateboarding and, and came up with a social strategy that was working pretty well. But then when I went out to high school, the social rules totally changed. And suddenly I, I was like, not part of the, the cool kid group. I was just some, you know, lost. I didn't really have a, a, a tribe. And I, I felt very kind of like isolated and just like I didn't, I, I needed a new identity at the time. You know, when you're a high schooler, you, that becomes a very dire, like almost existential issue. So I think Japanese gave me something to latch onto and uh, it provided me with a new identity because once I, I really made this identity of, oh, I'm, I care about Japan. I don't really care about American culture. You know, American culture is not for me. Japanese culture is way cooler. I'm, you know, it's, it's, it's more, it's advanced, it's superior. And I had this whole narrative that I told myself and it, it allowed me to run away from being a loser in America. It allowed me to say, oh, I don't, it doesn't matter what American people think of me because I'm going to go to Japan. And so that I had built my identity around that. So when I had got back from Japan and realized like, okay, what do I do now? I had an awful experience. I realized that a lot of what I thought Japan was, was actually just a delusion that I made up from watching anime. The reality is that, you know, it's just a normal country with pros and cons and, you know, it's, it's definitely not heaven on earth. Part of me thought, well, maybe I should just move on. But at the same time, my identity was so wrapped around that, that I think it, it, that, it was really hard to let go because it was like, well, I'm the Japanese guy. Who am I if I'm not going to continue to study Japanese? 
So I think that's part of the reason why I just decided to kind of like forget about my negative experiences and move on with Japan. But still, separate from that, there was also some real genuine interest and passion towards Japan, something deep within me that was pulling me there that had nothing to do with the, that identity stuff. And I still felt that. I still felt something that just there's something about Japan that I connect with that is pulling me. And so and that was still there, even though I had all the negative experiences. So I think the combination of just not being able to let go and move on, combined with that still having that seed of the genuine um, passion, allowed me to just say like, well, I'm just going to keep going. Like, I'm, I've come this far, I'm just going to keep on going. Gotcha. That was so Agreed. inspirational. <laughs> I felt that. <laughs> yeah, it's it, that's that that perseverance to keep going and just keep pushing through. It's like really important to have, especially after a tough spot, like you said, when you had that experience of of just negative homestay. You know, like they kind of that that can, like you said, could totally turn somebody off from a country, from a culture, just altogether. Um, and to be able to bounce back is really great. Yeah, it really spoke to me too because I kind of have that identity crisis like you have Matt like I just I don't know who I would be in life if I didn't have myself involved in Japan in some sort of way and I think these three can kind of agree uh that that's kind of like my identity as well so I just ooh, yeah that's scary to think about uh I don't even want to think about that oh. right. outside of anime and manga and I know that you said that that was the initial like kind of trigger for you in terms of Japanese culture but has there any has there been any other area of Japanese culture that really that really hit home for you or that maybe piqued your interest or made you want to learn a little bit more um, outside of, you know, like, is it like a sport or maybe just a certain aspect of like uh, Japanese culture? Like a lot of people are in love the tea ceremony type things or, you know, Japanese gardens. Um, you know, is there something else that maybe hooked you in along the way? Yeah, I would say probably the biggest thing is Japanese literature, because being so passionate okay. about the Japanese language, Japanese literature is really the kind of pinnacle of the Japanese language. It's really the, and also as a culture, I think uh, Japanese people really value literature and the, and the literary tradition within Japan. And and authors like Dazai Osamu or Natsume Soseki or Akutagawa Ryunosuke or Mishima Yukio are like really revered within Japanese culture. And, and they are really talked about even today, these authors that have been dead for multiple decades and so hearing so much about them within japanese culture even with anime they get referenced and they, they come up it made me interest like, so interested of like who was this author that was able to write uh, such profound texts using the japanese language that japanese people continue to talk about it like decades after this person has died and so i, I was always really interested in that and uh, i also that kind of led me to classical japanese as well i i have uh, studied the basics of classical japanese and was really interested in how Japanese evolved throughout history and and just yeah the the literary tradition and that even led me to ultimately being being interested in Chinese as well because uh, Japanese and and Japan Japanese culture have been very influenced by Chinese uh, particularly you know like around a thousand years ago when China was really the head of civilization in Asia so there's that's probably the, the biggest thing. But um, outside of that, there's like little smaller things like Jap I've gotten into Japanese comedy have, and for, for a while was really interested in, in like manzai and like what made manzai funny to Japanese people and, and the development of Japanese comedy throughout the, the last couple decades. Uh, and then also like uh, one of my favorite manga is Hikaru no Go. So I'm really interested in Go and that's something that is not unique to Japan, but Actually, reading Hikaru no Go got me interested in those types of games in general. So I, I like I love consuming any Japanese content about shogi as well, which is Japanese chess. Oh, shogi! And uh, yes. like I've, I've read a couple books by uh, this guy uh, Habu Yoshiharu, who is like the best shogi player um, in Japan. And and so I, I'm I'm really interested in, in in those things as well. That's awesome. So before we go, we wanted to give you an opportunity to pitch your new platform, Refold which is a guide to immersing yourself in not just Japanese, but any language that you want to learn. Yeah, yeah. Well, I imagine that if you're new to immersion learning, then a lot of the, the kind of statements I made throughout this podcast related to language learning might seem really counterintuitive. And if you're not sure how you would actually apply that in a practical way. So that's exactly what Refold is for. It's for taking all of these kind of abstract ideas about language learning and putting them into a, a structured study plan 
so that you know exactly what you need to do to start moving towards uh, the path of, of really mastering a foreign language, whether it's Japanese or, or any other. Uh, we break the language learning process down into four stages. The first stage is learning just the, the basics of the language in terms of grammar and vocabulary and the writing system. Stage two, you're getting good at comprehension. Stage three, you're getting good at uh, producing the language. And so by the end of stage three, you're at basic fluency. And then stage four is refining and trying to close the gap between you and a native speaker. It doesn't really have an end. It just goes on for as long as you're motivated to continue. So yeah, if you're interested in learning Japanese, I personally think it's the, be the best method out there. And you can find it at refold.la. We also have a free Discord community where you can connect with other people who are using this method of language learning and get your questions answered and things like that. We also have a Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash refold, where you can uh, access exclusive content and help support the uh, mission. Yes, yes, absolutely. So I, yeah, I've, I've been using refold for a couple months now, and I have seen more results using the refold and immersion method than I have using any other method of learning Japanese. So nice. uh, amazing, amazing resource free to use and an amazing community on discord to help you as well. So that's pretty much it. I think I can say for everyone that we really enjoyed this interview. It was super fun. You really put a lot of things into perspective. Uh, we really appreciate you coming on, taking time out of your busy, busy schedule um, to come on to our podcast and share everything with us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. And that's it for this week's episode. Thank you so much for tuning into the Crew of Japan podcast. In today's episode, we talked with Matt vs. Japan about his language learning experience through language immersion using Refold. He had a lot of great advice and insight that many language learners could benefit from hearing. This week, we encourage you to check out Matt vs. Japan on YouTube and watch some of his videos. He has a lot of videos on language learning that may help you pull through in your own language learning. Are you using any methods Matt mentioned in this episode to study Japanese? Share with us on social media. We're on Instagram and Twitter at Crew of Japan Podcast. That's K R E W E O F J A P A N Podcast. While you're there, subscribe and let us know how you're enjoying the podcast. That's it for today. Until next time.